Good evening, everyone. My name is Diane Redleaf, and I wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for coming to help us all honor my dad. I want to thank Carol Stoddard and, Ma Stoddard and Molly Miller from the ACLU and Samantha Charlton from our office, who did a wonderful job to put this event together. for coming up to Minnesota from Chicago. Um, several of you are here. Um, I want to especially recognize Secretary of State Steve Simon and State Senator Terry Bonhoff, who also came. I wanted to thank my mom, whose idea this party was. <laughs> and my parents for sponsoring all this delicious food, and my brother and sister-in-law, Lynn and Andy, Andy and Lynn, for sponsoring the drink, my sister Karen for doing the tribute slideshow. Um, this, thank you. This is the eighth Minnesota event for the Family Defense Center and the third one at this gorgeous club, the, the first one in this room, beautiful. Um, our mission is to advocate justice for families in the child welfare system. America's child welfare system is a national embarrassment. We have massive child abuse reporting, massive unmanageable <coughs> investigations, blacklisting of innocent people, destruction of families, and rampant gender, racial, and disability discrimination in the system. I've been working to shine a light on this system for 37 years. In 2005, I founded the Family Defense Center to do exactly that. This year, a large part of our work is on the simple proposition, let children play. By that, we mean let parents allow their children to play in parks next to their homes without being stopped by police or child protection authorities. What could be more basic to liberty than the idea that the government has no business dictating to a mother or father that a child cannot play in the park next to their apartment. Yet that's exactly what happened to our client, Natasha Felix, and it's happening in dozens of cases we have handled from administrative hearings to appellate cases. This is happening all over the country through our out of control child welfare system. Last January, we decided to write a report spotlighting 24 of our caseloads and I discovered we were truly the national experts on this uh, issue. No one else had 24 cases like ours because there's no other center like ours providing this representation. News of our report got into the Washington Post and we got an editorial for the first time in the Chicago Tribune uh, decrying the over-intervention of, ch of child protection in family life. The idea of letting children play has a very deep connection to the mission of the ACLU, and it encapsulated, encapsulates the two commitments my two parents have instilled in me over the many years I've known them both, to children and to civil liberties. The rights of families are basic to liberty. The rights of parents to raise their children are basic to children's ability to grow healthy and independent themselves. The rights of minority communities to raise their children are especially important because of the intersection of the child welfare abuses with police and criminal uh, justice abuses. I'm delighted to be able to share our mission with you and with our ACLU of Minnesota partners. And I'm especially excited to introduce our speaker who personifies the intersecting com commitments to justice that our two organizations share. I'm just going to digress a second and talk about how we got to involve Michelle and my dad in this intersecting work. First, I have to say, and I'm going to come back and give a little short speech, shorter speech when I come back to give my dad, help give my dad the award. But first, my dad is one of the most forward-thinking and supportive people I know in understanding what liberty and justice means. And second, he's also one of the most strategic people, too. I'm the one who first met Michelle Goodwin 
through our mutual connection to Professor Dorothy Roberts, a pioneer in writing about race, class, and gender, and who was our first honoree, which is when I met, I think, Michelle for the first time. When Michelle came to teach at the University of Minnesota Law School, I told my dad about her and urged him to meet her. My dad just didn't just file that suggestion away. He not only met Michelle, but he quickly pressed hard for Michelle to join the ACLU. And when my dad presses for something, eventually he gets his way. Tonight we're seeing the fruits of the many intersections and he, we are celebrating the many ways my dad has made all that possible. I'm especially delighted to tell you that Michelle has not, was not only a distinguished board member here at the ACLU of Minnesota and its national represent, rep, representative, but she is now an executive board member of the ACLU nationally. She is newly elected to the National Action Fund Board of Planned Parenthood and is a featured writer with the Huffington Post. I'm just going to read very briefly from her official biography, but I'm going to get tired in the process because it's real. I just picked out the highlights, really. She is Chancellor's Professor of Law, Director of the Center of Biotechnology and Global Health Policy at the UC Irvine Law School. She has appointments in five different departments by my count. Um, she is one of the leading, of, this is what the bio says, she's one of the world's leading authorities on the regulation of medicine, science, and biotechnology. Her publications include five books and over 70 articles and book chapters on laws regulation of the human body, including civil and criminal regulation of pregnancy and reproduction, reproductive technologies, human trafficking, and tissue and organ transportation. Her recent works appear in or are in forthcoming in the Harvard Law Review, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just don't know how she does all this. And we're all very interested to hear Professor Goodwin's very timely talk about the intersecting topics of mass incarceration, the new Jane Crow, and the family. incredibly generous introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here with family and friends um, on this very important occasion where we honor Paul Redleaf and Rhoda too. Let's give a hand for Rhoda too. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's a love affair, right? Uh, Paul's involvement with the ACLU uh, and Rhoda's support of that and so much more. So this is really a terrific occasion where we bring two organizations together, the Family Defense Center and the American Civil Liberties uh, Union of Minnesota, two incredibly uh, stalwart organizations working for people who don't have much. Now, what brought me to the ACLU here, of course, Paul, uh, but back in college, I was a member of the ACLU. And the ACLU is one of those organizations that's incredibly scrappy, and I love that about the ACLU. It doesn't get credit for all that it does at all. In fact, just recently, I hosted a reproductive justice film festival, and there's a very popular film out now called Trapped, which is documenting uh, some of what I'm going to talk about, which are these laws that have come about in recent years to encroach upon women's reproductive rights. And the ACLU isn't really mentioned, but the ACLU is behind all of that successful litigation that's been fighting back against that. And so the ACLU doesn't always do the job of branding that so many other organizations do, but it's the organization that has been in the trenches all the time from the very early stages. We're about to celebrate 100 years in the United States. And the ACLU has been about the First Amendment, but it's been about more than that. And the Family Defense Center intersects in such a profound way because it too has been in the trenches in some very dark and scary times for families. It, when Diane says we have to fight for families to be able to have their kids go to the park, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. And th that parents risk either criminal prosecution or the civil types of persecution 
uh, because they allow their kids to go to the park. And this is being labeled as negligent, having social workers have to come to visit their homes to see if they're appropriate parents and whatnot. Um, it's, it's really horrific. And so the work that Diane has been doing in the Family Defense Center uh, is incredibly urgent. Now, I want to start off with a reflection from Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who is a person who uh, lived during Jim Crow and died many, many years ago. Uh, and he was a poet, an African-American poet. And he wrote a poem called Sympathy. Uh, very often the poem uh, is confused to have been written by Maya Angelou. She wrote a book um, about the caged bird. I know where the caged bird sings, but many people overlap with this. And, and, and here's a, a piece from Sympathy. I know why the caged bird beats its wings until its blood is red on the cruel, cruel bars, for it must fly back to its perch and cling when he fain would be on a bow a swing. And the pain still throbs in those old, old scars, and they pulse with a keener sting. I know why the caged bird beats his wing. And it's a profound poem, this poem, uh, Sympathy, and it talks to us, it speaks to us about those who are entrapped, right? Those who are, are caged and can't get out. And when you think about the work of the ACLU, and you think about that profound work of the Family Defense Center, and of course we think about the legacy of slavery in our country because that's what Paul Lawrence Dunbar was writing about, then we can see why we're all brought together for this important occasion. So my remarks are at the intersection of this work, and I want to talk about mass incarceration. It's a topic that, uh, that we now see bipartisan support for, but the real tragedy is, is how much we've had of it and have tolerated over recent decades in the United States. And I'm deeply disturbed by what we miss in mass incarceration, and that is the impact on women and families. Though I can understand why so much of the attention has been on men uh, and incarceration in the United States. Well, first off, we should start that we incarcerate more people than anywhere else in the world, right? Um, the US incarcerates more people than the United Kingdom, than Portugal, than Spain, than Italy, than many of these places all combined uh, we incarcerate. Uh, the incarceration rate by comparison, we incarcerate well over 700 uh, people per 100,000. And in the UK, it's about 147 people, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty profound. And that's the narrative that shapes what we understand. And let's think about it in this context, the lifetime of likelihood of imprisonment, right? For white men, that's about one in 17, the life the, the likelihood um, of imprisonment. For Latino men, it's one in six. For African American men, it's one in three. And that's pretty profound, right, when you think about it. But this is a growing concern for women, too. For white women, it's one in 111 who will have a lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. For Latinas, it's one in 45. For black women, it's one in 18. And to give you some sense of what this means on the global scale, while we've talked a lot about in the, the public sphere about mass incarceration and men and how overwhelming it is, what many people would not know is that the US incarcerates more women than any other place in the world. The U.S. has only about 5% of the world's population. We incarcerate about 25%, right? Those are Americans, right? But I should also state, too, that we want to look at how we handle immigration as well with, um, you know, our immigration system is that if you are a refugee trying to get to the United States, chances are you're going to be in jail, put in a jail before we let you out because that's the process that we use. But to give you some sense of what this means for women, the U.S. incarcerates more women than Russia, China, India, and Brazil combined. And toss in Mexico, too. And that's pretty profound. Think about how many people are in India, 
or China, <laughs> Russia, and you toss in Mexico too, and yet in our country, we incarcerate more women than all of those countries combined. And once you begin to think about that, then we have to think about, well, what happens to the children? And we've lost that. We've kept that out of the narrative, right? But the women who are placed in jail, on average, have two kids each. What happens to their kids? Now, I have a colleague named Kristen Turney. And Kristen's research is really quite profound and I think important for this kind of conversation. Because her research reveals that children of incarcerated parents fare worse physically and also psychologically than children who've experienced a parent's <clears throat> death. Now let me repeat that. Children who have a parent in jail do worse both physically in terms of what, how their bodies shut down and their bodies react to it and mentally worse than a parent who is dead or who has died. And that is incredibly profound. Now when we think about how this has happened, much at least with regard to female incarceration, two thirds of the women who were behind bars were nonviolent offenders. And what would surprise many of you is that, or maybe not, not this crowd, is that, who is like the cynics in here, so this is good. I'm in a good crowd this afternoon. You guys aren't gonna be surprised by any of this. But much of that has been related to our failed drug war. Failed drug war. And on top of the failed drug war, what we have is family policing and the reproductive policing. And that is the perfected pregnancy, which we expect of poor women. We don't expect it of wealthy women. And here's how I'll give you an example of that. Research tells us that over the last 30 years or more, there's been a dramatic rise uh, in the use of prescription medications um, during pregnancy. And the people who are using prescription, pres being prescribed medications during pregnancy for back aches and headaches and other kinds of pains are wealthy, educated white women. They see their doctors and their doctors want to relieve them of that pain. They, they want them to be able to have a more comfortable pregnancy. They understand that pregnancy can come with stress and tension, and they want to relieve them of that. And so we see Oxycontin, Demerol, and other cocktails of medications being prescribed, right? It's, it's common knowledge, and it's been for some time. But on the other side of the world, this tale of two cities has been if you were a poor woman, and particularly if you were a poor woman of color, Latina or black, with the same headache, same back pain, same stress, about how will you take care of your family, you become a prime target for policing. Why did you use that drug during your pregnancy? Do you know what kind of risk this can be to your fetus? Why did you have that miscarriage? Why was that baby born stillborn or, or stillborn, that baby that was dead upon delivery? Now when you think about the consequences of this kind of policing, which is drilled right on down to prosecutors forcing doctors to reveal confidential information, doctors even being involved with police and creating drag nets, women being dragged out of hospitals in shackles and chains still bloodied after giving birth, only poor women, only poor women, and then women being forced into plea deals of 20 years. 25 years, 30 years. These women have been the canaries in the coal mine over the last 30 years in the United States. These were the women who were labeled as crack moms and whatnot, and the world looked by. Even organizations that focus on women's movements said those are not our people at all. Those are complicated women with their messy lives. That's not what we do. We're not into that. And yet, I say they were the canaries in the coal mine. Because once it starts, what stops it later? And this is what we're beginning to see across the country. So that when Wisconsin passed its euphemistic cracked baby mama law, intended for black women, right? You know, we'll, we'll catch you. Who's being ensnared, ensnared now? This is the last couple of years, white women forced into solitary confinement, going to their doctors, 
giving information that you'd expect to give to your doctors. This is what happened in my life and here's how I am. And then finding themselves surrounded by police, taken into custody, attorneys being appointed for their fetuses and not for them. Can you imagine a state justifying that it's doing this for the fetus when it puts a woman in solitary confinement and refuses to provide her prenatal care? That's doing well for the fetus. Or women in Arizona who've had to give birth in prison toilets and on prison floors. Or Lisa Epstein in Florida, white mother of five, who was told by her doctors when she, in her case, she wanted to have a vaginal delivery. And this is one of the spaces where it's cropping up now with C-sections, right? A lot of white women being targeted now who want to have natural births and the doctors, and it's not even really the docs, it's the folks that, folks that work in the, in the business office. Like, we want the C-section, we want to be able to time it, slice it, get it out, right? And so in Lisa Epstein's case, in her, she said, well, no, it's a Wednesday. Yeah, I know how this works, I've got five. You know, let me come in on a Friday. And her doctor sends her an email and says, you're about to leave me with my last resort, which is to call police and to have them drag you in here. Don't let me have to do that. Like, seriously? That was the last resort that you <laughs> needed to call the police and drag me in? Right? But this is the kind of hostility that women are encountering now. And that is why it's so important that we think about the work that the ACLU is doing the work that Diane wants to do because so many are being impacted by this. This dramatic rate of incarceration has led to some pretty terrible outcomes, but I should also say something about it. Many people have thought, well, the drug war has served some good purpose, but let me tell you this. While we've spent more than a trillion dollars fighting the U.S. drug war, it turns out the rate of addiction is the same that it was in the 1950s. It's never changed. It's been about the same. And if we had two graphs, if I had a PowerPoint up here, what you would see is that we could look at from 1950 to today, it's kind of level like this of drug addiction. And then we'd look at what we've spent on incarceration and it would look just like that. That's what it looks like. And that's also what it looks like in terms of female incarceration. The rate of female incarceration between 1977 and 2007 was over 800%. Over 800%. We have more than a million women tethered in some way to the U.S. criminal justice system. If they're not in jail, they're being monitored uh, by the state. And what have we done in the process? Here's what we've done. We've now created systems where we say that we're progressive because we have now created prison nurseries so that mothers can be closer to their children and their children can be raised behind bars. When I first heard about this when I was in the Philippines, I thought this was absolutely outrageous. Like this is what happens in the Philippines to political prisoners. But no, it's now what we do because we're being progressive. And can you imagine being raised in those kinds of uh, conditions? Even though there are laws that are passed now saying that women can't be shackled behind <clears throat> bars while giving birth, we've so normalized it that it continues to happen. Even in states where laws have recently passed, including in New York, where it is illegal to shackle a woman during childbirth, it still continues to happen. And here are a few other things that we need to think about before I wrap up in terms of what happens to the children. We now have not only privatized prisons, but we also have privatized foster care in the United States with incredibly poor outcomes in both systems. So here's what life looks like for a kid who, uh, whose parents are in jail and the kid has been put in foster care. Only 4% actually live in pre-adoptive homes, right? So he's like, well, there's foster care. And the state thinks that foster care is going to be better than your actual parents, but it turns out only 4% of those kids are actually going to live in a family kind of situation. Others are going to live in group homes, they're going to live in other kinds of institutions, shelters, and we're talking about kids even under 10 years old, run, you know, from shelter to shelter to shelter. And here are some other outcomes that we ought to think about. There is a researcher at the University of Chicago who's been following a group of 
uh, kids in the Midwest between uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Iowa, and he's been following them since they were adolescents, and now they are in their mid-20s. And here's what we know about those kids who age out of foster care, because one, we know it's not temporary. They stay, right? And then they age out. So when they age out, um, by age 23, less than 50% are employed, almost 25% are homeless, more than 75% are pregnant after leaving foster care, nearly 60% of young men are convicted of a crime, more than 80% have been arrested, and only 6% had a two or a four year degree. This is the system that we have created through the intersection of our uh, passion for mass incarceration and a very much failed drug war. And if anything, what these statistics help to show to us is the importance of the work of the ACLU and why we need to continue to do important work on the ground because the ACLU has been in the trenches representing a number of women uh, across the country. It's one of the first organizations that said we really need to provide legal services to women who are caught in these traps. Uh, and also the work of the Family Defense Center. Now, one of the things that statistics don't tell us is that they don't necessarily provide the human story behind this all. And so I'm going to close with just a couple of examples that make it real in terms of what I'm talking about. And here I talk about the case of Christine Taylor, who in Iowa was a woman who got off a, a, a phone call that was a bit traumatizing to her. her. Her husband had separated from her, had moved back to Baltimore. She was in Iowa with the two kids and pregnant. And she fell downstairs after that conversation. And she went to the hospital. EMTs came, but she wanted more than EMTs. And so she went to the hospital to make sure that her pregnancy was all right. And the nurse asked her, well, at any time, had you thought about an abortion? And she was honest. She said, well, you know what? My husband left me, so when I first found out that I was pregnant, I thought about abortion, I thought about adoption, I was trying to figure out what my options were, and I'm a mom with two kids, I'm single, I'm having to raise the kids. She didn't even get home before police surrounded her car. She was put in jail for three days while prosecutors were trying to figure out if they had enough evidence to charge her with attempted infanticide. Bebe Shui in Indiana, <clears throat> a few years ago, a woman who had also another traumatizing event in that her boyfriend broke up with her when she was pregnant. She decided she'd just end her life altogether and take five packets of rat poison. She survived because her friends found her, but the state's prosecutor, the, the local prosecutor, charged her with first degree murder and also attempted infanticide. And I could give you other scenarios over and over again of things that just sound absolutely crazy. But all that I want to do is underscore the importance of you being here tonight, the importance of understanding what's happening around us, and that it's really important that we support the work of these two important organizations that are trying to do some pretty hard but important work in <coughs> recognizing civil liberties and trying to represent and lift up the dignity of people who happen to have the least amongst us. And with that, I'll close. Thank you so much. Wow, that was a lot to think about. <laughs> Um, and thank you, Michelle, for making us think hard about all these things and, and for bringing it all together, which you did in an amazing way. Um, so I'm going to now, I think, have the pleasure of recognizing my guests. And I'm going to um, also uh, invite others. Um, Bill from the ACLU will join me in a minute, uh, and Bert no Newborn. Um, Bill will introduce Bert. Um, so Dad, I'm sure that your values, your persistence, your brilliant analytical mind, your generosity, 
your engagement in the issues that are most pressing in our society, and your commitment to freedom of thought, and your support for each one of your children to reach for the stars, and to believe that it is possible to change the world, and that it is important to try, led me to go to law school. I'm sure that even though you and mom might not have thought I should use my Stanford Law degree to work for poor people in the city of Chicago <laughs> by becoming a legal services lawyer, your own support for me made it possible for me to have a very long and very productive career that has made a difference to thousands of people. And I'm also very sure that if you and mom had not been there in 2004, when I didn't know what to do next with my own legal career and was at a real turning point, if you, if you had not said you would give $100,000 a year for five years to make sure there could be a family defense center, then there would not be a family defense center, which has exonerated tens of thousands of people and created a center that is at the forefront of justice for families in the child welfare system. That all these families have been helped by our efforts and they would not have been helped except for you. Your generosity and foresight have not ceased since then either. I can always go to you and mom for advice and support. Your experience on the ACLU board and so many other ventures has given you wisdom to share and many stories too. I cannot express my gratitude for all you have done. This, is a, this event is but a small token of appreciation we feel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bill Pedalovich, and I have the privilege right now of serving as the president of the board of directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota. And it is with great pleasure that I'm here tonight on behalf of the ACLU as an organization and its membership, and most particularly its board of directors, to honor Paul Redleaf. Now, I did not know Paul Redleaf before I went on the board eight or nine years ago. I'd heard a great deal about him, but I didn't hear about him as a great progressive or as a great civil libertarian. As many of you know, Paul, in a prior life, was a physician. And so it happened for maybe 20 years, he was my mother's physician. <laughs> and sometime, I don't know when, in the 70s or 80s, Paul retired from the practice of medicine to pursue other interests. Now, my father had passed away, so I was sort of the person my mother talked to about her medical conditions. And for the next 25 years of her life, no matter which doctor she went to for which malady, I would say, how did it go? And the answer was, he's no Dr. Redleaf. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here today to talk about my mother or Paul. <laughs> so I suspect there are stories that could be told. But we're here to talk today about a man who has been an important philanthropist and change agent in this community. A man who has set up the Redley Family Foundation in 1977. And annually, that foundation donates a major portion of interest income to nonprofit organizations. Much, fortunately for the ACLU of Minnesota, much of that philanthropy has been directed to the ACLU and has helped us maintain financial stability and build an organization that has been able to protect the civil liberties and civil rights of Minnesotans for the past 20 years. Paul joined the ACLU, I'm told, when he was still in college. And he's been on the board of this organization for at least 25 years, if not more. Paul's belief in the necessity of achieving racial equality in the justice system has led him and his foundation to make major gifts which have established the ACLU's innovative Greater Minnesota Racial Justice Project, which has done immeasurable good in improving racial relationships first in Bemidji and the Bemidji area uh, in connection with the White Earth Indian Reservation and currently and for the past several years in southwestern Minnesota out of our office based in Mankato, which focuses 
on civil liberties and civil rights issues as they pertain <clears throat> to uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants, particularly those who work in migrant work as migrant workers and in food processing facilities and other uh, small town Minnesota agricultural businesses. So it is with great gratitude that on behalf of the board, <laughs> the ACLU of Minnesota is giving Paul the President's Award. Now the President's Award is given very rarely. The last time it was given was 30 years ago, <laughs> in 1986. We are very fortunate today to have the person who was the recipient of the President's Award 30 years ago here to present the award to Paul on behalf of the ACLU of Minnesota. So I'm going to call in a moment upon Bert Newborn, the former legal director of the ACLU of Minnesota, I'm sorry, the ACLU nationally, who was awarded the President's Award by the ACLU of Minnesota in 1986. I first came across Bert Newborn, at least his name, not the actual person, in about 1985 or 1986, when the ACLU, the ACLU of Minnesota, Planned Parenthood of Federation of America and Planned Parenthood of Minnesota joined forces to challenge a law that the Minnesota legislature had passed, which prohibited minors from obtaining abortions without the consent of both of their parents. Uh, the ACLU's Reproductive Freedom Project, which worked under uh, Bert's aegis, joined with us in bringing that lawsuit. I represented not the ACLU at the time, but actually Planned Parenthood of Minnesota and Planned Parenthood nationally, in challenging that law, which ultimately was held partially unconstitutional all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it was in the midst of that that Bert retired from the ACLU and received this award. He's currently the Norman Dorson Professor of Civil Liberties at New York University Law School. And he's also founding legal director of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, which I'm sure many of you see quoted in the paper on all sorts of issues all the time. He served as the national legal director of the ACLU, as I said, from 1980 to 1985. And we're fortunate that he is actually a member of Paul's family. He is married to Paul's first cousin, Helen Redleaf Newborn. And I would like to call Paul up here to present the President's Award. I'm Bert up here to present the President's Award to Paul. Bert. Thank you. It's uh, a delight to be back. Um, I always joke, uh, I got a, a number of awards from the affiliates. Uh, in 1986 uh, when I uh, retired as ACLU legal director and I've often said they were very grateful to see me go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, let me, let me say uh, something that I had just not expected to say. You realize, of course, that you are in the presence this evening um, of a remarkable voice. Uh, Michelle Goodwin is uh, a, a national treasure. Um, and the degree to which she has been able to bring together strands of thought uh, that uh, people had ignored for a long time is remarkably important. So that was, it was a wonderful talk, Michelle. Thank you. Um, let me also say something personal. Uh, um, uh, many of you uh, may know that Paul uh, entered Cornell uh, a university in 1948, um, and his academic record was so brilliant uh, that when my wife Helen uh, applied there about a decade later, uh, she was admitted. Um, uh, and uh, because they probably thought that she was, you know, Paul's sister or something. And, uh, and she was admitted, and that's where I met her. Uh, and we met and married uh, at Cornell just as Paul and Rhoda uh, met and married at Cornell. Uh, and so I owe Paul a great debt because without Paul's academic record, Helen doesn't get into Cornell. I never, I never, I never meet her. Um, and my in-laws don't have to deal with a scholarship kid from Queens who married their daughter. Um, uh, but it was, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful story. Um, uh, let me also, let me say something professional. Uh, it's not just personal, professional. Um, um, 
the two organizations that, uh, that you're honoring here tonight, Family Defense Center and the ACLU, uh, are extraordinarily important organizations. They're extraordinarily important organizations because they are among the most successful of groups. Um, groups of comfort. <coughs> the ACLU is not made up of four people. They, um, uh, there are a few members, but it is a comfortable organization. And the support for the Family Defense Center does not come from poor people. Poor people lack the resources to be able to uh, organize the, um, the, the, uh, the, the uh, resources and people necessary to speak for them. And so the important thing about both organizations, and Michelle's talk said it so well, is they can see the world from the bottom up. Um, and they, they have the capacity to express what it's like to be on the bottom to many of us who are always on the top. Um, uh, and that ability to articulate what, uh, the, what life is like for the powerless in institution after institution is probably the single most important thing toward maintaining this society as having the hope of being a genuinely moral place to live. And so I salute both organizations. My, my life inside the ACLU has been a joy. It's one of it was a great pleasure to uh, work um, uh, for so many years there. And watching um, um, Diane's work at the Family uh, Defense Center uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is also um, a joy. And there's something special about that Redley family. Uh, um, I mean, you've got you know, Paul and Rhoda, Diane, my wife Helen uh, Redley from Bourne, uh, who was one of the principal draftsmen of the Violence Against Women Act, was the director of the Now Legal Defense Fund, and for 21 years a leader at the Ford Foundation in fighting for low-income women. So there's something to be said for the Redley family, and I'm glad to be a collateral piece of it. <laughs> so, uh, finally, a little something political. I just wanted to remind you of um, the state. Um, uh, in this coming presidential election, um, um, but also the, uh, the, the narrower stakes about the Senate's failure to take up the nomination of Merrick Garland to fill the slot on the Supreme Court. Um, you've heard lots of arguments about um, uh, whether it is, is or is not within the constitutional obligation of the Senate uh, to carry out its responsibility to advice and consent. Um, um, I want to just mention one thing that I haven't seen. Uh, in the press, but that you may want to think about because it is the thing that haunts me about the failure to consider Garland. Um, uh, we're, we now have a 4-4 Supreme Court. Um, and the 4-4 Supreme Court on ideological issues deadlocks. We've seen them deadlock several times already this term, and they will deadlock at least two or three more times before the term is over. Um, a deadlocked Supreme Court can't decide a case. Now, think about this. We are about to experience a tumultuous presidential election being held under circumstances where at least 17 states have enacted um, voting uh, 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 rules designed to suppress the ballot of the weak and the poor um, and people of color. Um, all you had to do was take a look at the Arizona primary, where as soon as Arizona was let out from under the Voting Rights Act, they, they closed 70% of the voting uh, booths uh, in Maricopa County, where the Latino population lives. People waited seven hours to vote in the Arizona primary. And there are 17 states, including North Carolina, whose law was upheld yesterday um, and is now being appealed to the Fourth Circuit as quickly as possible. But there are 17 states in which there will be profound questions of law that are going to arise on election day as people are shut out of their right to vote. Um, and if it's a close election, please God, don't let it be a close election. Yeah. Uh, but if it's a close election, um, um, there is not going to be an adult in the room to resolve the legal questions that come up. Imagine a 4-4 Supreme Court unable to resolve legal questions that may determine who the President of the United States is. We are looking into a potential constitutional crisis because of the Senate's refusal to perform its constitutional duty. And it's not just a matter of politics, and it's not just a matter um, of, uh, of well, we were, the Democrats would do it if they were on the other side. We are now risking, we are gambling with the future of the political structure by not having in place 
a Supreme Court capable of resolving. Now, the worst decision I ever saw in my lifetime was Bush v. Gore. The last time they resolved an issue, but at least it was resolved. Imagine what the world would have looked like if Bush v. Gore were 4-4 and there were no way to resolve the question of what the Florida recount would be and what the appropriate uh, 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 electors in Florida would be. We would have had a constitutional crisis unparalleled in the nation's history and the President of the United States, the anchor of stability in much of the world, the last thing we can afford is to have instability about who the president is going to be and how the succession in the, in the mightiest nation in the world is going to be carried out. And yet that's what we're gambling with now. Uh, so my hope is that to the extent that you have any um, uh, interest in politics and interest in dealing with people, if you let your representatives know how important it is to put maximum pressure on to see that there is some form of confirmation hearing uh, for Judge Garland. Now, let me say Judge Garland's not the judge I would have wanted. Uh, he's quite, he's more, much more moderate than, than, than the judge I would have hoped um, uh, that uh, President Obama would nominate. But he is the fifth vote uh, for resolving important questions. Um, and it is important to get about, get about the business uh, of seeking to confirm it. So now, the real, real reason they brought me here is that I'm a very, very good reader. And they've asked me to read to you um, the, uh, the, the plaques and to uh, uh, award all uh, the plaques. And it was really a joy to do it. So let me, let me read. Um, as you might expect, the ACLU's award much longer. Oh, my goodness, much, much longer. But let me read the Family, the family Defense Center plaque. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the Family Defense Center plaque reads, and it's, a, it's, it's really a, it's, it's, it's a lovely heartfelt. Uh, the Family Defense Center proudly presents the Catalyst Award to Paul D. Redleaf for his extraordinary commitment and transformative contributions to the Family Defense Center's advocacy for families in the child welfare system. Congratulations, Paul. The ACLU's tone reads, um, resolution to honor Dr. Pro I'm just teasing, of course. I spent, I spent a lifetime in the ACLU arguing that they should be longer and writing more stuff. When I was legal director, it was unparalleled how long it was. Um, resolution to honor Dr. Paul Redley with the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota's President's Award. Whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf has been a member of the American Civil Liberties Union for over 60 years. Whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf has had a lifelong commitment to civil liberties, whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf has served as a member of the Board of Directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota since 1998, whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf has served for many years as a dedicated member of the Finance and Legal Committees of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota, whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf's financial support has been critical to the viability and success of the American Civil Liberties Union American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota for many decades, whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf's financial support has made possible the protection of minorities from unequal treatment by the criminal justice system through support of the Greater Racial Justice Project of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota, whereas the focused philanthropy of Dr. Paul Redleaf has strengthened the governance of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota and provided it with long-term financial stability. And whereas Dr. Paul Redleaf is a great American, Minnesotan, and civil libertarian, now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Directors of the American Civil Liberties Union of Minnesota wishes to express its tremendous gratitude to Dr. Paul Redleaf by bestowing upon him the honor of its presidential award.
first of all, it should be clear to everyone that this award is not to me alone, but is to Rhoda and me. Because everything that I've had to do uh, has been done uh, in consultation uh, and discussion uh, uh, with her. And uh, it's only the fact that uh, she already has received many honors <laughs> yes, her organizations that I'm being singled out uh, at this time. But uh, uh, Rhoda is, is equally uh, deserving uh, of, of this overwhelming uh, honor. Now, I, I've been told that uh, my speech should be limited to two, two minutes, but that's <laughs> impossible because I have to thank, I have to thank uh, Carol and Diane for the inception of this idea, and then to uh, the uh, many members of the host committee who were responsible for bringing out this uh, uh, amazing uh, and highly gratifying uh, audience. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can't uh, call you each by name and, and thank you, but, but believe me, uh, I, I appreciate and we all should appreciate uh, your efforts. Uh, I, I have to say that, that uh, in doing the things that Rhoda and I have done uh, uh, and that have been recognized today, uh, we, we really never thought that we were doing anything that exceptional because uh, we, we did see certain things that we thought would be desirable uh, that weren't happening and that could happen with some resources that we were in a position to commit and there was no reason not to do them so we, we, we did them. And, uh, and we had a lot more fun than we would have had by simply writing a check because all the organizations that, that we've been committed to, we, we've actually enjoyed uh, a part in, in, in participating actively uh, with. Uh, so uh, having said that, I, I think it, it would be appropriate to, to realize uh, the, the vast amount of luck that has resulted in my being up here uh, to receive this award. Uh, in 1931, uh, a white male had a life expectancy of 70 years. And I've passed that by about 50, uh, which is amazingly lucky in itself, but I passed this without any major health issues and with one day of being sick in bed in my entire adult life. Now that's, I think, rather extraordinary. And that's pure luck. Uh, my meeting Rhoda and our, our getting married, you know, is a story of unbelievable luck because here was someone from Cleveland and uh, a New Yorker and Long Island native uh, regarded anyone uh, west of the Hudson River as being someone <laughs> from a, uh, another culture. <laughs> but, 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 but somehow, uh, there was one year uh, in which our uh, residents in Ithaca, New York, uh, overlapped. And uh, 
a friend of my mother's had uh, mentioned that this uh, girl from Cleveland was going to be in uh, Ithaca at Cornell, and I should look her up. And uh, freshman girls were uh, at a, a premium because of the ratio <laughs> of men to women in, at Cornell uh, in the days when uh, engineering was a purely male uh, endeavor. Uh, was about seven to one. So uh, <laughs> even if you looked up a, uh, a freshman, there, 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 there was very little likelihood that you'd get through. But, <laughs> but, 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 but somehow, I, I, I managed to call uh, Rhoda uh, in late October or November, and, and, and we did meet. And, we didn't realize it at the time, but that was the last time I ever had a date. <laughs> now, 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 Rhoda went back to Cleveland and she says that, 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 that she had only one date where to, to say goodbye to an ex-boyfriend. But, but, but from that time on, uh, we, we were a couple. And we survived a year of separation when I started medical school and she was uh, still at Cornell. And we survived total lack of enthusiasm by both my parents and <laughs> parents <laughs> about this uh, liaison. And, uh, and, and we, we, we did uh, uh, manage a, a, a wedding which uh, the anticipation of made uh, Rhoda's mother violently ill. We did survive all of that. Uh, we, we survived uh, then uh, uh, an early start on our uh, family development. Uh, <laughs> in the uh, days before Roe v. Wade. <laughs> and, 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 and we decided to survive uh, a move to Minnesota, which, which was indeed uh, very stressful uh, for, for Rhoda with uh, a six-month-old baby. Uh, but she uh, took that as a, a trooper and uh, took uh, uh, with equanimity uh, or relative equanimity my decision to come back to Minnesota after my two years in the, uh, in the Army. And uh, we, we continued uh, a, a normal middle class life uh, until 1980. When I made a rather rash decision to abandon a comfortable career as an internist, uh, to embark on a uh, risky uh, career uh, for which I had absolutely no training. Uh, and uh, uh, she uh, acquiesced to my becoming a uh, a trader on the, on the option exchange, where uh, by total accident on uh, October 19th, 1987, a date which you may not recognize immediately, but which has become memorialized as Black Monday, I happened to find myself, not in Chicago on the exchange, but here in St. Paul at a doctor's appointment, and I just happened to have an option position which I never would have gotten into voluntarily uh, because I was in a position which was going to lose money uh, day after day if the market didn't do anything. But, as it happened, 
The market did a lot. The, the market crashed 20% while I was at the eye doctor. <laughs> and, and I got down to Chicago, and I found myself at the end of the day uh, up a very substantial amount of money. <laughs> totally accidentally. So, so he, he, here, here, here was uh, luck uh, uh, playing itself out. Uh, and then when I finally decided that there was no point risking uh, uh, the unpredictable things that could happen uh, uh, as a trader, uh, I should cash in uh, my chips. I violated uh, a basic rule of investing, uh, uh, of diversifying. I put everything in the hands of one investment manager. Now, I thought he was bright and I knew him well. <laughs> he had gone broke twice. <laughs> but, but I, I, I had confidence and, and Andy uh, took my uh, savings and uh, for uh, any number of years uh, generated double digit returns and, and, and so uh, all of this ha has made possible uh, what we've been able to do and uh, uh, as I say I, 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 I've just been very lucky because things could have been otherwise and I could have been uh, rightfully uh, categorized as being uh, uh, rather stupid in, in some of the things that I, I did. So, thank you once again for this, this overwhelming and uh, uh, I think largely undeserved tribute. <laughs>
Here is how you join Paul's army. Make a donation. You can uh, give any the amount indicated or the other, which by the way means more. <laughs> Feel free. You can designate, notice the front of that uh, modern draft card, half of it's addressed to the Family Defense Center, the other half to ACLU. You can choose one, both, either one, and you can designate. That's how you join Paul's army. And while you're doing that, let me just suggest one other use of Paul's army, which will swell in numbers, thanks to everybody in this room. If it should happen that we have a president in this country who decides that the government should go out in the streets and arrest everybody who looks Mexican or Muslim or God knows what else and send them away, you can be darn sure the first group that will be fighting against them is Paul's army. So join Paul's army. Join today. We wanted to invite you to rejoin the auction, and my mom is going to welcome you to the final, final step of this party. I was told I was supposed to say that the auction was going to close in about 10 minutes. <laughs> but before I say that, I have a couple of other things I'd like to say. <laughs> Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank my daughters, Karen, for the marvelous slideshow that I hope you've all looked at. She's been working at it for a long time, and it's just really delightful to see all those pictures that she has assembled, and my daughter, Diane, who of course has been organizing activities for quite a while and doing great things that we're all very proud of. Um, I was a little overwhelmed by Paul's talk. <laughs> um, it, most of it was true. <laughs> it is kind of an incredible story. Um, I'm glad I went to Cornell University. <laughs> it was my first choice in high school. And I have to tell you that it was a very unexciting experience applying to Cornell University because my high school counselor was obnoxious. <laughs> um, but I did prevail, and I did end up at Cornell, and because of our parents' mutual friends, we did manage to meet, which was interesting. <laughs> um, but the gist of my message is that you are to eat a little more. <laughs> there seems to be more food on the buffet, so I hope you will all enjoy it. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Uh, I'm really, really. Uh, we do hope to cut the birthday cake. It is, in fact, the fact that I'm married to a very old man. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm almost as old as he is. <laughs> pretty good shape for the age we are. <laughs> this is really a very exciting event, and I'm delighted that Paul is finally being honored, <laughs> because he has sat through, I can't tell you how many honors for me. <laughs> because women 
women's organizations are much better at organizing. <laughs> Really he's been very good about coming to all the things in my <laughs> So please join us in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yes. 10 minutes more for the auction. And there's food still available. And then we'll cut the cake. <laughs> well, I think we could sing happy birthday. In fact, yeah. Paul just had a birthday. He just turned 85, and I can't believe he's that old. <laughs> so, would you join me in singing? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.